Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. Good morning. Special Lord's Day. We're going to partake of the Lord's table together at the end of our service. And we have the blessing of corporately remembering what Christ has done, the ransom price that he paid so that we could be redeemed from eternal death in this world and sin. So Jesus, thank you. Let's pray then and ask him to meet us in a special way this morning in his word and this ordinance that he has left for his bride, us. Let me read our passage that we will be looking at this morning and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Paul says in Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege to gather with your blood-bought children from all different areas of this globe who have been brought together as one in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we will now sit shoulder to shoulder, linked by faith in Jesus Christ, remembering our blessed hope of the one who hung on Calvary's tree in our place. And so God, we, we pray that you meet us in a, in a special way as we remember such glorious truth. And I pray now as we open the word of God and continue our worship that you will meet us here. Lord, we are, we are treading on ground that um, our hearts need to hear. Uh, it'll be painful, uh, necessary, and um, fruitful. And so we just ask that your spirit would do the perfect work in each heart individually by these words of truth. So illuminate them now to our minds and hearts. Holy Spirit of God, we pray for the glory of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we began looking at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And just have we really taken in the grammar of the gospel is what we asked ourselves because the grammar of the gospel is so important to the Christian life. And what we've learned is that now we're going to be looking at imperatives. And imperatives are commands. And all commands in the Christian life are rooted and grounded in what's called an indicative of God's grace. An indicative is statements of fact or truth. And we've spent 11 chapters in Romans looking at all the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that now is the foundation and the empowerment to go live the gospel imperatives that Paul is going to just start shooting rapid fire and the rest of this epistle. And so the Christian must pour over and learn and meditate over God's saving grace to look at these gold nuggets of salvation again and again and see them from every angle. And through these realities, we find power to begin to live the powerful imperatives of the Christian life. And so I warn you as we start that these imperatives will destroy you if you are not grounded in grace. You're going to look at them and go at them by law and your own strength and try to change yourself. And they have shipwrecked many people through the centuries of this world. Bishop J.C. Ryle in the 1800s said, Sin and immorality have slain their thousands, but moralism and works have slain their tens of thousands. And so we damage the gospel in our own lives if we miss the grammar of the gospel. If we just focus on our doing, it will bring great harm to your soul. And that's why the, we said last week, the minister of chapter 1 through 11 and 12 through 16 is therefore, and therefore brings us all together. And so every soul must have a therefore. All that God has done in Christ, therefore, now go live this way for the King of Kings. So quite simply, the Christian life is letting the truths and implications of the gospel work out in your life. I'm loved by God. I am adopted by God. I have eternal life that is guaranteed by his grace to be secured. I am no longer under the law. I am under grace. I've spent 30 years growing and learning about these truths and how they flush out in my life, and I I'm, I'm still feel like a bedwetter at this. I just keep learning and growing and want more and more. 
And so how they bring the change that I want to live for my God, we're just going to keep looking at more in the next week. So when we get these mercies of Romans 1 through 11, we offer up our bodies to God, a living sacrifice. We are not called so much to make sacrifices, so to speak. We're to be the sacrifices. God, here's my, my life. I'm giving you me. I, w- I wonder what would happen if we truly got that. Isaac Watts, I got to read a hymn to you. Isaac Watts, one of the great hymn writers of all time, I just want to read to you at the cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote his sacred head for sinners such as I? Was it for crimes that I had done he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ, the mighty maker, died for man, the creature's sin. Thus might I hide my blushing face while Calvary's cross appears. Dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt my eyes in tears. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. That's Romans 12.1. Jesus doesn't want your things so much as he, as he wants you to gladly surrender your life to him. He bled and died for you. He bought you. He purchased you. Here I am, Lord. Send me. The great missionary Hudson Taylor said, if Christ be God and died for me, is anything too great for me to do for him? My favorite thing is when Some religious person says, don't you think you're overdoing it a little bit? To want to give God your every breath and effort is called legalism in our day, and God calls it your acceptable worship. God calls it a holy, living, pleasing sacrifice. Which leads us well into this next verse this morning. (coughs) How do I do this, Pastor? It's my heart. When I look at these mercies of God, My desire and my ambition are what you're talking about. But when I put my head on my pillow at night, there's just too much indwelling sin that's causing me to not do that what I want to do and that which I don't, I I hate. So here's my my battle, my battle with remaining sin. And Paul now is going to help us with that because the, the mercies of God have brought this new motivation and this new surrender. But the reality we saw is we have remaining sin and we also have a, a, an influence or a force against us trying to get us not to offer up our bodies to God, a living sacrifice. And that's where we move this morning into verse 2. And, and, how is this offering going to ever take place? And he's going to show us that there are two forces that either help it or hinder it. And so no surprise to any Christian, there is a battle. Again, before I was saved, I had no battle. I just followed sin. I never battled it. I just offer it, I jumped on it. And now I've been saved and now I have a battle. I want to do what's right. I want to please God. And I have this new nature and sin that indwells. And so there is a battle. And here it is, and here Paul's going to help us to fight that battle. And he's going to give us two commands. And we're going to look at a command this week and a command next week. So as I study this book, I'm seeking God and studying and saying, God, show me the truth and how it flows and what what is it that that Paul's getting at. But then I always ask, Lord, what does Southside need? What what does Southside need? need from Romans that I'm observing. Obviously, all of it, but what what do you sometimes you park on and sometimes you you teach, but you move over a little quicker? Because if you park on everything, we're going to be in this for 30 years. (coughs) Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I I just think we need some time on this. And so two weeks. We need, 
God to drive this deep into our hearts so that we'll shine the glory of God to a dark and dying world by the way that we live our lives and how different we are from this world. So the two commands, the negative, do not be conformed to this world. There's an outward pressure that's pressing on us and squeezing on us. And the positive is, Christian, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it's this inward work of truth and how it's going to begin renewing and changing us from one image of glory to the next. So two powers working uh, opposite ends, opposite directions. We, we have resistance from the world and we have renewal from truth in the Word of God. And catch this, they're both in the present tense. So this is all of our lives, every day, all day, the world is pushing on you to be conformed to it. And, and, you, and all day long, we need the truth being constantly in our minds and renewing the way we think about life and godliness. And so both are here. So let's consider the first command this morning. Do not be conformed to this world. And as we begin, I want you to pull up in your own minds. I just want to ask you a simple question to you. What is worldliness? When you hear that phrase, what comes to your mind, just give it a thought. What is worldliness? How would you define it? What do you see it as? <clears throat> to me, if you get that wrong, you're going to be conformed to it. So what, this morning, we are going to park, what does it mean to be worldly? And sometimes I've heard it's like the, the, the punk rocker, uh, it's the corporate executive with his, you know, little briefcase and materialistic, cheating everybody. Or it's the, the moviegoer that loves Hollywood and they're just saturated in it. It's the guy who golfs on Sunday or the one who has a mansion or the gal that wears too short of clothing. How, how do you define it? How do you define worldliness as you sit here? And to me, this will prove to be important if we're ever going to obey this command that we get it right. And I think many times we, we get it wrong. We get the, the, the fruits of worldliness maybe instead of the roots. And so I, I hope as we look at this, it's going to help the, every child of God this morning. Because if it's just similar to the list that I just gave, you'll always be fighting, I don't do these certain things, and, and you, you could end up being a Mennonite and or you know where where we're out of the world altogether and that's happened throughout history a lot don't be conformed to this world let me move out of it let me get out of it that's what it's saying to do and it isn't that isn't the answer so what i would like you to do is come with me this morning with an open heart to god's word and let it do surgery on your heart i'm, I'm inviting you come hurt with me this morning because it, this hurts but it's for your good and God's glory. And maybe come with one presupposition. We live in America and we are so numbed to worldliness. We don't even know how much we've been affected by it. We're like the frog in boiling water. Any missionary who ever comes back is away from it and they're just taken back by it when they come back. And we're just sitting in it, just drinking it up, used to it. And so I'm hoping that God will pull back the veil and remind us what worldliness is and to check our own hearts. Is it getting me? Is it conforming me? So I want to begin with just this. It, it usually isn't a loudspeaker. Sometimes it is to say, hey, this way to worldliness. But it's a force. This morning, it is a force trying to conform you that is always working against us. So we fight against the devil our own flesh. But the way I see that being worked out is in the world. The devil's over the world. He's the God of this world. And he's, he's bringing its teachings and its thinkings and all these things and our flesh are biting it. But it's in the world where this is going on and conforming and drawing us. So we need to think about this. It's a subtlety, the way it works. The world's influence progresses sometimes by imperceptible degrees with a permeating power. Some of you know one of my favorite movies of all time is Remember the Titans. And there's a guy in there named Coach Boone. And Coach, coach Boone has this old, old coach, and, and, he, and he pulls out his playbook, and he goes, that's a pretty narrow playbook. 
And Coach Boone goes, it's got six plays. It's like split veers, like Novocaine. It always works, just like the world. <laughs> it just always works. Meaning, you may be being conformed to it this morning as you sit here and not even be aware of it. And I've just been praying that God would show you if it's got its tentacles in, into you and conforming you uh, to its image. And, and if I could make one observation from our text as we begin, is, is because of the and in verse 2, it's trying, the world is trying to lead us away from what? From offering up our bodies to God a living sacrifice. So we, we come away, give God your life, use your members to serve him. And now this world is trying to draw you in to use your members for sin and the world and your own pleasures. And it, so it's, it's, it's working to keep you from doing the beautiful thing that we looked at last week. So this force called world wants you to use your body for sin and not for the glory of God. It wants you to be like everyone else and just kind of float and go with it and think like it, dress like it, act like it, have the same hopes, the same desires, get mad at the same losses from your football teams. And it, it just wants you to be exactly like it, conform you to it. And so get this, we have to be resisting the right thing. So what I want to do this morning is give you a primer or a treatise on what is the worldliness that's trying to conform us, and then we'll make some application at the end. <clears throat> so six, six aspects to help us understand worldliness, and I'm just going to trace it through the whole Bible and then look at what Paul's talking about. So the first thing I want to look at is the creation of the world. Where did it come from? Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day, so God spoke it into being. This is his incubator to work out his plan of redemption. And so this world that we live in was made by God for his purposes. God spoke it into being. It was good. And then came the fall. One of the saddest verses in the Bible we studied in Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Our representative head was Adam, and he, he plunged us all into destruction as our representative head. And now we come into the world, spiritual stillborns, separated from God with the wrath of God upon us and the nature of self. So something so foreign to this beautiful, perfect cosmos that God made, sin entered it. That, that's, that's why we battle all that we have this morning. That verse, sin entered the world. And it brought with it misery and destruction. And, and every week in ministry, I, I deal with these hard things of death, cancer, jobs, families, divorce, sickness. This week, one of our little cherubs we almost lost with a dangerous blood pressure level and conflicts. Why? Because sin entered the world. This beautiful cosmos, paradise, sin entered into it. And the immediate consequences were death. There was a, a spiritual death instantly. Adam's now hiding from God. No more fellowship, a sword that keeps him out of the presence. And now there's a physical death. We begin decaying and dying and cancers and sickness now come into our bodies. A curse came upon the whole world. Romans 8 says it's groaning for our redemption to be set free from the curse that was brought upon it in Genesis. And so now we have to toil and work and these poor ladies have to labor having babies and they desire to control their husbands in Genesis. And so this, this beautiful world went from it's very good to Genesis 6-5 where it says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great and that every intent of his heart was only evil continually. <laughs> it's no longer paradise. It's just broken broken, broken, everything separated, God, man, sin, the world. So my third point then is creation, fall, the, the present state of the world, as we come into it, 
spiritually dead and, and we're blind to the things of God. We're blind to his glory and his beauty and the purpose of this world. We come in broken and, and think that we're the center of the universe and everything's about us and revolves around us. That's what the fall has done. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and even if our gospel's veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing in whose case the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who's the image of God. They can't see it. The, the devil's blinded them now. 1 John 5, uh, 19, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And so now the devil's the God of this world. He, he's the power over this world and that's all the chaos and brokenness and sin that we live in. He hates God. He just hates them. And so I want you to get this then. Every system in this world and structure and thought and program and ethic in this world is opposed to God. If you ever want to know what does God want, look what the world wants. And it's always the opposite. They're in antithesis of one another. And so this world is so broken because it, it just hates God and it wants self and pleasures. And this whole thing is a mess. In James 4.4, 4, you adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? They're just, you can't have them. If you love this world, you hate God. If you love God, you hate this world. The two systems cannot go together. You cannot straddle both kingdoms. God either transfers you out of the kingdom of darkness to his kingdom of light. You can't stay in both. <coughs> this world, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Please hear that and believe it. Get that in your heart. A little world never hurt no one. Yes, it did. It makes you an enemy of God to love this world. Romans 1 says that they looked at this creation, this beautiful world that tells you there's a God and they suppress it in unrighteousness because I want my sin. I don't want a God to tell me how to live. I want to be God and I want to do what I want. And so this whole world, it, it will not have God. It wants to be God. That's what has happened. And, and Paul says in Romans 1, they didn't see fit to have God in our minds. So the fall now is, I don't want God. I don't even want to think about him. I don't want him in my life. Put him out. And it says they, they would not, by looking at this creation, they would not honor him and give him thanks. They wouldn't give God glory and thank him. That's what happened to this world. It was made to glorify God and worship him, and now we won't. The world will not, and everything is in antithesis to the worship of God. These two cannot be bridged. And we live as if there was no God, because our minds have been blinded. We live for the here and now. We have the heart of worldliness in us. And as we heard this morning, don't love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I, I just don't know how you can say it clearer. For all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world's passing away and it's lust, but the one who does the will of God will abide forever. So what I want you to get then is this world is controlled by the devil and his forces and his thinking, and he's blinded the whole world so that now we live for the lust of the eyes and flesh and the boastful pride of life. That is the spirit. That's the way this world thinks, feels, acts. It's Paul said, according to the flesh, those who set their minds on the flesh are at enmity with God. And so the result is everything then in this world, its designs, its fashions, its goals, its pursuits, its values are ungodly. They're off. They're crooked. They're bent. They're opposed to God. Hollywood, anti-God. Advertisements, anti-God. There's no neutrality. Quit buying that lie. It just all sits in the lap of the evil one. The more neutral it appears, the more dangerous it is to your soul. And so all this devil wants to do is defame God and use your instruments to defame God and serve him. That's what he wants. He doesn't want a whole offering to God and his service. So he's got this whole system 
to get you to serve yourself and hurt others and defy God. And all this system is designed for the opposite. <clears throat> That's how you come into the world. You encouraged? You're born into this age. And I love what Paul chooses for the Greek word, not cosmos. So it's not, don't be conformed to the cosmos, which is that beautiful just creation. But he's choosing the other Greek word that it's more of the, the age, the, the thinking of it. It's system. Don't be conformed to this. So don't be conformed to this world. It's not so much do I wear designer jeans or not, but the spirit of the age. It's evil. I know some of you have come out of witchcraft and you have told me the evils that go on behind the scenes and what most people are numb to and not even understanding how evil it is. The world thinks horizontal and, and the believer is now vertical to God. The world looks for the visible and we live for the invisible God. And the world thinks temporal and we think eternal. And so these two systems the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world are an antithesis to one another. And one is seeking to conform you and destroy you. And the fourth is salvation comes in the midst of a world that hates God in which we all walked. Everything was built around worshiping a creature. God plucks out his people and he opens their eyes to see the radiance of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ and the gospel, you fall in love with him. And now you become a citizen of another world. And, and he throws these words around like they're nothing, we do. Uh, you're a citizen of another world. You've come out of that, that, that age. He's taken you out. He's brought you now. And now your world and life view is that from God and through God and to God are all things to him. Be the glory forever. Amen. It changed everything. The, the, no one in the world will ever say that. And we've been plucked out to make God everything. And you set your minds on the things of the Spirit. You're now about eternity. And now you can offer your bodies up to God, a living sacrifice. And so I've said before, this world is like a black velvet that you put a diamond on and God plucks you out. So that, that, that black velvet is this whole world system. And it smells and it's polluted. And God plucks you out now to shine and radiate. And so this world is the black velvet so that the glory of God would shine forth from your life. And so we're, we're plucked out to radiate. So he's saying, don't go back to loving the black velvet. That's only there to show everyone what it's like to be lost and damned and everything other than God. Don't love it. Don't go back. You're, you're done with that. I've, I've lifted you up now to shine the glory of God in this world. It's now, let's get our hands on uh, so much of this world and still be a Christian. It's not, my life is the same as my neighbor, but I'm just going to heaven. It's not, God's blessing me because this world is dripping out of my mouth and oozing out of my pores. I'm just so blessed. It's trash. I just keep finding new ways to pamper my flesh with all of these blessings. It's lies. You know how God's blessing you? Because you're not being conformed to this world, but he's transforming and conforming you to Jesus Christ through every trial that you're facing this morning, every battle with sin, every bit of it is why you're not being conformed to this world. God is changing you and causing you to quit hoping in this dying world that can't deliver you. So you would hope only in Jesus Christ who raises the dead. Galatians 1.4. He gave himself for our sins. Thank you, Jesus. That he might deliver us out of this present evil age. Same word, according to the will of our God and Father. He, he, he paid the ransom to bring you out of this world, to take you from this bondage and this hellhole, this death. He's paid it. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, Jesus Christ, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age, to, to live in this, this age of the world with a whole new heart 
denying ungodliness and worldly desires because the grace of God has appeared and brought us salvation. Jesus in John 15 in the Upper Room Discourse said, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. This cosmos will hate you because it's anti-God. And if you were of the world, the world would love its own. If the world loves you, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I'm tired of a Christianity that I'm trying to figure out how to, how to have Jesus and have the world love me. Stop. Because you are not of the world, but I chose you, listen to this, out of the world, therefore the world hates you. I chose you out of this world. I saved you and I've made you new and gave you whole new passions and desires and a message. Therefore, this cosmos hates you. They hate you. That's because these two are, they're just opposite. So if God takes you into one, the other one's going to hate you. Die. Be done with this world. Sorry, the Sunday school class got me so fired up. I think I'm a little over the edge. Galatians 6.14, I love this. But may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I, the world is now a dead, bloated carcass to me, and I'm a dead, bloated carcass to this world. It sees no value in me any longer because what I love and treasure, they're not going to approve me, they're not going to love me, and I don't want, that, I don't want what they got. I'm, they're, they're crucified to me. I look at all, every commercial, every rich person I've ever met, all the models, all these things. I don't even want what they have. You're, you're dead to it. Is that what's happened to your heart? The world's been crucified to me. I had my time in that, and it was death, ugly, gross. I was so sad. I was suicidal. It was awful. <laughs> and now I've got the kingdom of God. One last one, 2 Peter 1, 4. For by these, he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in the gospel in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. You've been brought out of that life of being controlled by your lusts and your desires to have this world. You have the divine nature that you partake with to bring you out of that. Salvation is from this world and its mindset and the flesh and the way that it thinks. So worldliness is not so much about what car or clothes or how long your sideburns are or whatever nonsense. Just so much deeper than that. And some of those are manifestations that for sure you got to deal with. Not the sideburns, but you know, worldliness is finding your pleasures and delights in something other than God. It's a system that wants you to delight in anything but God. It's living for the seen. I got, I got to have the gusto. I got to get it now rather than for the unseen. It's thinking that the here and now is what it is. It's not longing for your true home. It's making this home, trying to make this paradise. And that's all you do is live for the lust of your eyes and your flesh and your boastful pride of life. And the church has brought this crazy system right into her. We just brought that harlot right into our midst and think like it. And we, Paul says we recognize no man according to the flesh, and we still do. And all this junk from the world and the way it thinks in this, this whole church growth movement was how to think like the world and bring the world into the church and all these things. And my own heart sits here before you this morning. There's just parts of the world that have conformed me. And it's like God keeps showing me. Man, it's getting warm in here. Is that preaching or is that because the heater's running? Turn the heater off. Sanctification. I hate to say this. That was all introduction. <laughs> this is the sermon. So now he plucks you out. And in Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed 
to this world. That's what this passage is talking about. So God, how then do I live while I'm in Christ and in Denver? Paul wrote to the Colossians and says, to the saints in Christ in Colossae. And so we are in Christ and still in Denver. And so how do I live in the midst of a system that is anti-God and everything that's about it? Well, I've been born again and I'm in Christ and everything I'm about now is that kingdom. That, how do I pull this off? And that's what Paul is saying now is you're going to live in this. Do not be conformed to it, child of God. It's in the present tense. It's passive. Don't be being conformed. It's a force that's playing on you, trying to draw you in. So don't, don't let it draw you in, and it's an imperative. He's commanding you, don't let the world conform you. The Greek word for conform means to fashion something, to put it in a form or a mold. Don't let this world mold you into its thinking in the way it is. Don't, don't let it draw you in. Uh, the root word is scheme. Don't, don't let the age you live in force you into its scheme of thinking and behaving and its values. Don't, don't let it bring you in to think like it. Don't, don't think like this world. Don't let it conform you. J.B. Phillips' translation says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. Don't let it conform you. Don't let the system get you. So the question is, have you come out of this system or do you still live in it and all of its influences and all of its desires and you've added Jesus next to it? That's not gospel. I pray at night and I read a psalm in the morning and I just go after this world and I thank Jesus every night for how much of the world he gave me. That is not Christianity. It's deceitful. And so what I want you to do this week is I want you to ask somebody who knows you really well and just say, will you be honest, please? Am I being conformed to this world? What do I look like to you? And, and if you're asked that question, be honest for their good for their conformity to Christ. Let's help each other because it's a frog in a boiling water. I need other people. So I, I see this. And to have someone check you and let you know, man, I, I'm being influenced in ways that I shouldn't. Some of you kids, you have these parents who love you and they're saying you're getting conformed. And you're like, legalist. My friends all say I'm cool. Stop. Listen. Someone's trying to show you this world is not your friend. You know, you know how many people I've watched in 30 years of ministry think the world's their friend and they play with it and it, and it destroys them. It wants to destroy you. It's not your friend. It's anti-God. And you, we have people here trying to shape you and help you to renew your mind. And so when you're playing in the world and thinking, oh, it's okay, I'm just having a little fun, listen to parents, Sunday school teachers, leaders, listen to those who want to help you not be conformed to this world. Are you with me? L listen. So what do we do? Do we run to the hills? Shut off all social media and news sources and we'll be fine. If I just stay out of the world, it can't get me. And the problem is the, the world's in us. <laughs> so what did Luther try? He went to a monastery and he confessed sin for 20 hours a day, whatever it was. And, and how do you sin in a monastery? <laughs> because you got your indwelling sin and your wrong thinking that the world has already brought into your mind and all of this stuff. So it, it can't just be run away from the world and hide. Uh, people have done that throughout church history. And it, that isn't the way to do it. It doesn't work. I promise you that is not the answer. That says, God saved me for me. And he didn't. He saved you for his name and for the advancement of his kingdom. And so here it is. That is putting your light under a bushel. Put it under a, bu a bushel. That's a bad interpretation of this passage. James says, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father 
to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by this world. It means you come into the world, you live, you're still living here, you're in Christ and in Denver, and as you're living in it, not to be conformed to it. Don't, don't take on its thinking and its ways. So you're, you're going to have to enter into this world to love it, to seek its salvation, to help it, but you've got to come into it and not be conformed. Go in and press up against it, but don't let it change you and make you think and love the things that it loves. Jesus said it simply. You're to be in this world, but not of it. You live in this thing, but don't think like it and love like it and desire the things that it, it wants. That's what will make you a light. Go into it, but you're a new creation and you hope for whole different things. This is the power of the gospel is how different we are and where our evangelism has died is we're like the world. That's what's killing the church. David Wells put it well. He said, the church is no longer in the world, but the world has never been more in the church in its history. Man, we could spend a week on that statement. The church is no longer in the world but the world has never been more in it. God, have mercy on us to be in this world, but not of it. So while we live in this world, while we seek to let our little lights shine, while we seek to win the loss to Jesus Christ, let us do so by our excellent behavior and let us do so by not being conformed to this world. Let us be eternal in the midst of a temporal society. Let us live in vanity fair and show forth the fairest of 10,000. Let sin, let us sin have all around us while we proclaim our Savior in this world. And how quickly this crazy world then will ruin a sacrifice of Romans 12.1. And so look at what it's done throughout history. It made Lot's wife a pillar of salt. It made Achan buried under a pile of rocks because he coveted. Judas' guts were spilled out. Demas left us for his love of this present world. Ananias and Sapphira lay slain on the ground because they loved the approval of men. Four soils, one was choked out and died because of its cares of this world. Killed him. Please don't let this world destroy you and call it freedom. If salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing. And there was only one way that salt can lose its saltiness, to mix it with dirt, to mix it with the world. And you just mix it and take the world in and keep eating it and putting it around you and you'll no longer be salty. You'll be just like it. And then it says it'll be good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled under foot. I want to just read a few scriptures as we close. Jesus said in John 12, 25, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. 2 Corinthians 1, 12, for our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience that in the holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. We have lived with excellence in the world among you, Paul says. And then 1 John 5, 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith in Jesus Christ. And so what I hope this morning is you get is that the world was made perfect. Sin entered. The God of this world now blinds the minds of the unbelieving so they don't see the glory of God in the face of Christ. This world, all its values, desires, all of its goals, all of its teachings are anti-God. It's not neutral, it's a suck hole trying to draw you in to think its thoughts and destroy your offering and sacrifice of worship to God to use these members for his name's sake. We've been plucked out of it. We have to deny this world's way of thinking and living. If you spend your whole life uh, is my dress too short? Uh, do I, can I eat meat? You know, all the, if you just spend your whole life on those things, you're going to miss the heart of this. Has the world's way of thinking taken over me? Don't think like it anymore. 
but be next week, be transformed by the renewing of your mind as, as the scriptures reveal Christ to us. And then lastly, there's going to be something called glorification. And there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth where everyone on that new heavens and new earth, their, their, their main object, their center of all will be the worship of God. And there'll be no more sin, no more influence of the world or the devil. Everything we value, desire, goal, taste will be for the glory of God. And we get to spend eternity together with that focus. So the end of this battle is absolutely glorious. And I commend you. Uh, you will never get to the end and say that was too much. That was too much battle. Revelation eleven fifteen. 15, the seventh angel sounded and there arose loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Application. I have 20 points. So I'm going to make some big decisions up here on the fly. First application, what really is your hope? I just want you to, to wrestle with the, the new mind. And if I'm still in this world, my hope is this world. And every time I don't get what I want in this world, I'm angry at God and I'm mad. My hope's this world. And when my plans don't work out for my kingdom and this, I'm mad. And so this is kind of this gut check. What am I about? What is my hope? And I pray it's that, that kingdom that's coming. And that's what we're looking for and living for. And I can hold all things loosely on my way to glory. And do you need to cut back how much of the world's thinking you take in on a daily basis? Just stop and be reminded of what this world is. And are you taking in its thinking all day long and wondering, why do I not hunger and thirst for God? I just eat up everything in this world. Some of you are the best at sports talk radio, and you know everything about every detail of the Broncos, and who cares? And you spend all your time always listening to the world. And it's just, I get my phone out, and I spend three hours so I know Everything that goes on in this world that hates God. I could save you three hours. Everything you read is people who hate God. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so just, I, I, my own heart, what do I need to check? That I live in this world, but not of it. And I just, am I just taking in too much of it? And I promise if you are, you're not offering up your body a living sacrifice. You're just not. And so this is the part that hurts to do an honest gut check about what I am taking into this world and how much because there's nothing wrong with knowing certain things about your trades, your hobby. I'm not saying that. It's just thinking. And if you're always taking it in, it's not neutral. Just check that. It is not neutral. And if I do my Christian women's Bible two-minute devotional book every day, and spend 10 hours and taking in the world, what do you think is going to control your thinking? And so to, to just give God sloppy leftovers, not renewing your mind next week, you, you'll see. And so if you're not making that Romans 12 one offering, there's a reason. And there, the world's conforming you. And next week we're going to learn how to fight it and how to renew our minds and our hearts. And so that's the beauty is that God gave us his Holy Spirit to keep working the worldliness out of us, to keep growing and renewing us in truth. And so there, there's great hope for this horrible battle of the world that we're in. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Leave with a great hope that you have something greater than this world that's trying to conform you. You have the Holy Spirit of God within you. And so next week, we're going to look at the positive beauty of what God can do to overcome this world. And here's my 20 points of application. I'm just going to do one. So I'm, I've been thinking, what are ways that the world's conforming the church? And one of the ones that just hit me that I just, I'll just touch on is just gender, marriage, the, the role of a man and a, and a woman. And so what's happening is the world is telling us what 
You know, you don't even know if you're a male. You, you don't know if you're a female. Um, it's okay if guys marry guys. There, there's all these things that you're, you're being told and taught, and, and it's coming into the church. And, and, and so where, where we're coming now is the world's trying to conform us into its image and we're the ones who have the truth and we renew our minds and change and we see that God made marriage and he made it beautiful and he said it's between a husband and a wife and they come and they cleave together and, and in union they can have spiritual and physical and emotional intimacy and so this whole thing has been designed beautiful by God and he made roles. He made men to be men and to, to be leaders. And, and he made women to have this beautiful role in all that they do in the church and marriage. And, and he just made a perfect design. The creator knew how to make you. And so what you're doing is the world's coming and saying, no, this is how you have to think. The, the, throw off all this old school stuff of the Bible and it's just conforming. And I've watched this again and again. That first step off the cliff is, what's wrong with a girl liking a girl? And it just started there. And then it just flips to, well, what's wrong with abortion? What's, what's wrong with, and then it just gets to where you finally just apostatize and throw away the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's this world trying to conform you and bring you in. And so I just want all these little sweet lambs at this church. God made you a little boy, and that's beautiful. And he gave you the word of God to learn how to be a man of God. And he gave you parents. He gave you leaders, men in the church, that we, you know, this Saturday, the men's meeting, we want to help you to learn how to flourish in what God made you to be a man after God's own heart and to treasure how he made you and be used as an offering to bring much glory to God in the way that he made you. And the same thing with girls, the beauty of how he designed you. And so I, I want us to come and let the older ladies, we have some of the godliest older ladies to teach you how to be godly women versus trying to be men. Okay, girls, don't try to be men. God made you beautiful. And the design, it's so Awesome. Learn. Renew your mind. The world's squeezing you, telling you something different than the Word of God, and it starts with that little thought, and I'm telling you where it will lead you. You're going to wake up and go, what happened? And so just don't let the world squeeze you into its thinking and tell you that you can change your gender or I need to be a man if I'm a girl to really be complete. And all these things are lies from the world trying to conform you. Treasure that God made you a boy or a girl or a man or a woman. It's his beautiful design. And treasure that marriage is a male and a female to put on display the glory of the gospel as the way God designed it. And so don't let this world conform you and tell you that all deviations from his beautiful design are normal or okay. Renew your mind. And I know there could be some sitting here right now just going, that's, that's mean, Pastor, that's evil. And I want you to know, I love you so much that God has a, a, a design and a plan to bless you. And, and so this isn't to harm you or hurt you. Every one of us got kicked in the shins today with our sin of worldliness. So it isn't picking on anybody. It's we all have to renew our minds in truth. And so I beg you to not listen to this world and take those steps off the cliff of saying, no, I think there's a better way. No, that's not what the scriptures really say. And so don't be conformed to this world. And I'll throw out one last one. The world, if you go to the world for parenting advice, it'll be wrong every time. So just pray over it and, and it's crept into the church. And so if they call it Christian, that doesn't mean it's Christian. Go to the word of God and learn how to parent by the word of God and with the examples that God's given you in the body of Christ. And so I got a whole bunch of other ones. Cancel culture, question authority, we go on and on. I'm going to shut up. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's pray. Father, I thank you 
I want to make this offering. I want to use my members to make much of you. I want to glorify you in the way I think, act, behave, speak, things I say in public, private. God, I want to be the same man in secret as I am in public. Lord, we desire to be salt and light. And so I pray, Lord, that that we know there's a force trying to keep us from serving you the way we desire. And this system is so big and deep and evil and pervasive. It is the air we breathe. And I pray, don't let us breathe it so much. God, let us breathe the pure oxygen, the pure air of the word of God that renews minds and lives and hearts. And so help us to do the hard work this week to examine our lives and see areas that need to be cut back, mortified, maybe cut off. Maybe a hand needs to be cut off this morning or an eye plucked out. God, whatever it is that is conforming our thinking and messing with us, Lord, let it be thrown out, thrown off this morning by the grace of God because of the mercies that we have found in Christ Jesus. Let it be that we are under grace and makes us hate and deny ungodliness and worldly pleasures and desires in this world. God, let the gospel flood our hearts to want to push off everything that's anti-God. And I thank you for this beautiful word. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.